Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Stephen. I work at uh, Cashflow Manager. Um, so I've been working with Blazer for a few years now. Uh, we started a web application. Um, yeah, about two and a half years ago, and we decided to go with Blazer. It's a little bit of a punt, I guess, at the time because it wasn't actually released to production yet. But we kind of knew that Microsoft were planning to support it properly, so we thought, oh well, it looked pretty good. We sort of done some trials and weighed it up. But um, yeah, so today I'm not pretending to be an expert on Blazor, but I'm sort of just talking through my own, I guess, experience and the pros and the cons and all the sort of things that I've found as I've been working with it. Um, so this is just an overview of what I'm planning to cover tonight, uh, starting with, you know, what is Blazor? Um, there's two main flavors of Blazor. Uh, there's Blazor Server and Blazor WebAssembly. There's also Blazor Hybrid, but I won't really be touching on that at all tonight. Um, I'll be focusing on Blazor WebAssembly because that's what we've been using, but I'll just touch on, you know, what other differences basically to give you an overview. Um, quickly go through a very brief history of Blazor. Um, it's basically the timeline of when it was uh, started and that sort of thing. Um, why use Blazor? So just talk about some of the reasons that we, I guess, things that influenced us to choose Blazor um, over some of the competing kind of technologies like React or Angular. Um, then I've got a demo of some of the key kind of Blazor concepts just so you can get an idea, uh, you know, how to create components and how to pass parameters, that sort of thing. Uh, performance pitfalls, so there have been a few uh, performance issues are found along the way, which most of them have uh, ways that you can get around it, but there are a few things that's just handy to be aware of. Um, a wrap up, just really brief talking about the good, the bad and the ugly from a very personal perspective. Um, and just yeah, any questions you know, it has at the end, um, or if you've got questions as we go, feel free to ask them. Okay, so what is Blazor? Um, so firstly, it's a single page application framework, uh, sort of similar you know, to Angular, React, Vue in that sense. Um, so it's basically C-sharp code that runs on the browser uh, using WebAssembly. So it's running the native C-sharp. It's not translating it into JavaScript or anything like that. Um, and using Razor views, which people might be familiar with MVC. Um, so what I'm talking about there is really the Blazor WebAssembly flavor of it, which is the main one that people probably know about. Um, I'll get into the Bla what Blazor server is in a sec, which is a bit different. Uh, also, just the name is Blazor comes from browser plus Razor. Um, it's open source, so the code's freely available, uh, free to use. And yeah, as I was sort of mentioning before, there are three different flavors of Blazor. So we've got Blazor WebAssembly, which I'll be talking about tonight, Blazor Server, uh, which I'll go over in the next slide, and Blazor Hybrid, which is relatively new. Um, that's for using Blazor to develop desktop apps or even mobile apps. Um, I don't know actually that much about it, and I won't be covering it tonight. All right, so Blazor Server. Uh, so Blazor Server is basically um, HTML content that gets rendered on the server and it's sent to the browser via SignalR. So it's not actually running WebAssembly at all. Um, any events so that happen on the browser are handled in JavaScript and then they're sent back to the server through SignalR so that the server can then handle the event, send back a response through SignalR. So the whole thing's, yeah, I kind of think of it a tiny bit like MVC except it's, it's using signal R to kind of minimize the traffic. Um, uh, so you have a persistent connection with um, Blazor server. Uh, so there is a requirement that you are talking to that same server. So you kind of need session affinity for that. Um, one of the benefits over Blazor WASM is it runs on older browsers. Because there's no WebAssembly requirement, it means you don't really need any modern browser to run it. Um, the initial startup time is very fast with Blazor Server. Unlike, we'll talk about this in a sec, but Blazor Wasm has a few issues around the startup time because it has to load quite a lot of um, DLLs for the very first time. So that's something you won't find in Blazor Server. Um, 
just because it's uh, server based uh, rendering, you've got a higher CPU memory usage uh, using Blazor Server because it's basically doing all of that stuff on the server as opposed to the client. Uh, I did mention yeah, previously about with Blazor Server, it needs a persistent connection to use SignalR. So I wouldn't say it doesn't work with load balancing, but you probably have to do some extra work because um, it does require session affinity for that. Um, also, it can be a little bit sluggish in comparison to the WASM, um, just because it has to be talking to the server all the time. So that kind of depends on network speed and you know just the usual things, how close you are to the host and things like that. Also, obviously no offline support because it needs a constant connection to the server, so you can't do offline apps with that. Uh, oh, skip one, sorry. So Blazor WASM, which is what we'll be going through today. Um, so that's C sharp code running in WebAssembly on the browser. Um, it can, because it's just a spa, basically, it can be deployed just using static files. Uh, it can support offline mode um, if that's what you've programmed. You know, like any other spa, you'd need to handle sort of data syncing and stuff when you go back online, but that's one of the um, possibilities. It can quite easily be deployed as a progressive web app. Uh, that's one of the Visual Studio templates that you get. And that really doesn't require much effort to um, to do that, if that's what you want. Um, yeah, obviously, because it's a spa, reduced server load, so you're not chatting to the server all the time. It's just sort of when you're calling an API, you have to get back a response, that sort of thing. But essentially, because it's running on a browser, it's not putting a lot of load on your server. Um, one of the biggest, I guess, complaints about Blazor, which we'll talk about a bit more later, is the initial startup time, because this is just the very first time that the user goes to that app. There's a whole bunch of um, .NET DLLs that need to be loaded up. Um, there are some things you can do to improve that, which we'll talk about at the end, but yeah, that's sort of um, one of the things that you can't completely get around. Uh, .NET execution is a bit slow. Well, I'll talk about something you can do to mitigate this, but out of the box, .NET execution is a little bit slower than a server variant of .NET or even running on a desktop. And that's just because on a server, it would be using, um, well, often using ahead of time compilation, whereas when it's running on the browser, um, by default, it's not. Um, so it's all interpreted, which takes a bit longer. There are options to actually, since .NET 6, to turn on the ahead of time compilation option which can make it run faster. It, the only problem is that it uh, increases the size of the DLLs considerably. So kind of already got this big startup time problem and yeah, just making that worse when you do it ahead of time. Um, sorry, I've just got a message saying my battery's low. I might double check, but maybe I didn't, I didn't turn it on very much. <laughs> Good. Um, OK, yeah, uh, only works on fairly modern browsers. I mean, that's not such a problem these days, but you know, you do require a browser that supports WebAssembly, which you know, most browsers do these days. Uh, just because it's a single page application, it's not very SEO friendly, so you kind of have to do some extra work if you want just for discoverability and things like that. All right, so this is a brief history of Blazor. Um, it hasn't been around for that long, so 2017. Uh, it's got Microsoft Steve Sanderson who came up with this idea and started working on a personal project. Um, 2018, it was adopted by Microsoft and so they started working on it. 2018, they released the first uh, preview of Blazor. Um, by 2019, in September, they released the first production release of Blazor Server. Uh, and then May 2020, they released the first production of release of um, Blazor WebAssembly. And then uh, November 2020, .NET 5 was released, which included some uh, Blazor enhancements. Uh, so we got some performance improvements, which is actually quite considerable. Like I, when we first started with Blazor, I was running .NET 3.1, and it was really quite sluggish. I was like, oh, I'm not really sure about this. Like, but then, yeah, .NET 5 came out, and I tried the preview, and it, yeah, it was like quite a lot better. Obviously, did a lot behind the scenes. Um, 
they did introduce something called virtualization, which is. I won't go into much depth on it, but basically it's a way of getting more performance. If you've got like a large list or a large grid, uh, you can virtualize it so that it's only going to be rendering the parts that are on the screen at the time rather than trying to render everything. Uh, CSS isolation was introduced, so that basically having a style sheet or CSS style sheet that maps directly to a component so that those styles only affect that component as opposed to being global. Um, so there were other improvements, but that was kind of the key things uh, that stood out for me in .NET 5. Uh, .NET 6 was released in November 2021. Uh, so the more more improvements in performance, um, they did introduce the ahead of time compilation, which can potentially speed up the code execution quite a bit. But uh, as I said before, it also adds quite a lot to the um, size of the DLLs. So you've got, you've got to weigh up. What's more important also, it's more of a speed up for uh, CPU intensive stuff. So it might, you know, if you're obviously bound more by network requests, then you're probably not going to notice much difference there anyway. Uh, they introduced hot reload, which they introduced for, you know, a bunch of other uh, .NET application types as well. So that was kind of handy for debugging. It made things a bit easier. Uh, they also introduced hybrid app support for Blazor. Um, which, yeah, so you can basically code in Blazor and uh, you code for the desktop or code for like a mobile device. Um, it uses, I think, integrating with other technologies as well. Um, as I said before, I don't know a whole lot about the hybrid side of that. OK, so why use Blazor? Um, so these are the reasons that we chose Blazor. Uh, so we were working in a team that had some desktop developers uh, familiar with a bit of C Sharp and a bit of VB.net. Um, so we were kind of trying to integrate them into the web project. And we thought, well, you know, if we can stick with .NET, then it's not such a leap to you know, move to a whole new world. Um, so that's one of the reasons if anyone is familiar with so MVC using Razor views, you're already going to have a head start with Blazor. Um, so another really big benefit is you can share a lot of your code between your back end and front end, presuming that you're using .NET on your back end. Um, so that means like you can have this exact same models, you can have the same validation rules, any kind of common business logic that you can run on the front end, you can share. Um, you know, just any general utilities like we have a lot of you know string extensions and things like that. So that's really handy to be able to just not have to sort of duplicate that, which I've had to do in the past, you know, using JavaScript frameworks. Um, so there are some potential performance improvements over JavaScript. Um, so WebAssembly can run quite fast. I'd say that I haven't really seen, I've seen the performance to be quite reasonable, but I haven't seen it to be faster than something like React. I think it really depends on what you're doing. Like maybe if you're doing something that's really CPU intensive, you might see some improvement there. Um, and this is completely personal or subjective, but people who don't like JavaScript you know, and who like C Sharp, <laughs> you get to code mostly in C Sharp. You do have to touch JavaScript occasionally, so you can't 100% avoid it, but for the most part, you can. Uh, so high level concepts. So these are the things that I'm going to go through quickly in a demo. Um, these are sort of the key things that make up a Blazor app that you'd have to think about when you're developing. So everything in Blazor is about components. It's a very component driven framework. So you've got components, which could be a page, but then that component can have a lot of child components. So you're basically building things in small isolated blocks for reusability. Um, so within components, you have Razor views, which form obviously the, the HTML side of that. Um, Components can have parameters, so you can pass values from one component into another one, and that can control the behavior or the look, things like that. Um, I'll just skip that. We'll talk about cascading parameters, um, which are really quite a handy way of passing a parameters. Instead of just passing a parameter from one component to another, you can define a parameter at a sort of parent level and then that value will flow down to all the children automatically, and then the children can just pick up that value if they need it. So that's actually quite handy. Uh, talk about events. So, you know, components can define events which they can invoke at different times, and then you can have another parent component that can handle that event. Um, 
Render fragments are uh, another key laser concept. That's basically just being able to inject custom HTML from a parent component into the child. So often you have like a placeholder for, I want this bit of HTML behavior to be defined by the parent. So that's what render fragments are used for. Uh, the component life cycle is kind of, if you're developing in Blazor, it's an, important to understand. I I didn't want to cover it tonight because it gets a bit too in depth and I, you know, I didn't want to make this a really long presentation. So I probably won't go through that, but if you've got any questions related to that, let me know. Um, the layouts we'll go through, uh, that's fairly self-explanatory. That's just similar to MVC. Um, you can have a layout for a component which kind of defines the outer, how the outer shell, I guess, looks like if you've got a sidebar or a top menu that would normally be in a layout and then you have a whole bunch of views that would share that layout. Uh, dependency injection, so that's built in to Blazor. You can, in a component, you can just um, inject stuff. I'll show you how to do that, just like you're doing normal .NET injection. Um, I'll show you how to navigate to pages and how the routing works. Um, we we'll briefly go over a really basic form just so you get an idea of okay, how you deal with data input in Blazor. And then we'll just talk a little bit about JS interrupt, which is basically how Blazor code talks to JavaScript. And also you can talk directly from JavaScript to Blazor. So there's, there's always has to be JavaScript involved still because um, Blazor can't talk directly to the to the DOM. So when it even look behind the scenes, it's um, talking to JavaScript to do a lot of stuff like that. And you can do that yourself as well when you need to. All right, so I've got a demo app that I'll just bring up if you bear with me for a second. C sharp as the connect to the No, it still has to go via JavaScript. There are a lot of cleverness. There is a render tree, so basically it tries to limit how often it has to do some of that stuff. So it'll kind of compute in memory okay. if something's changed. And then it also only talk to the DOM when it decides it has to. So it's not completely stupid about it, I guess. But that. <laughs> I might just need to change the screen that I'm sharing here as well. Try that. OK. Uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> that's all right. I'll just have to look here because that's disappeared from my head. OK, so. I was just going to go through each of these and feel free to ask if you've got any questions. So this is just a little demo app that I made to demonstrate some of the different. Uh, I guess key parts of Blazor. So if you look on the left here, I've got the code and then the demo apps obviously on the right. So this is a component. Um, this happens to be a component that routes to a particular URL, but we can go through that in a second. Uh, you note that all components inherit from this component base class, so you don't actually have to write that inherits, but it will just do that by default. I just sort of did that to explicitly show up. Um, that's one of the, what they call in Blazor, a directive. Uh, so the directive starts with this. Um, at symbol, that page is another example of a directive. So this is just a uh, basic HTML, nothing special about that. Um, uh, just demonstrating here how we interact between the view and the code. So in Blazor, by default, you just put a separate code block at the bottom of the file, and then you can define all of your code there. This is, in this case, we're just initializing a value to like a new GUID string. And then you can see inside of our razor view, we just use this at symbol to refer to any of our C sharp code. So here we can basically just insert the value that was defined in our code. 
Um, and just to demonstrate the way that I guess the components initialize is they don't stay in memory. As soon as you leave this route and go to a different one, it's going to basically dispose of that component. And then as soon as you come back, it will recreate the component. So I don't know if you take any note, you can see that it ends in 2F at the end, and then if we move out, come back, we see it's a different GUID. So every time it's basically calling this and re-initializing re it from scratch. Um, so that's the very basics of a component. There is a way that you can use a partial class to actually have the code in a separate file to the view, so you don't have to have it in the same file. Um, can get a bit messy sometimes if you've got, especially when you get like really big components and you start having a code in the view, it gets a bit messy. So you, you can separate it that way if you prefer. The events, uh, this is a, I just want to bring up the file for that one. Yeah, so I'm just going to demonstrate how events are handled in Blazor. So if it's a like a um, built in of HTML element. Uh, we already get a bunch of, you know, the normal sort of HTML events that would be applicable to that element. Um, so you just have to use the app symbol and then you just type the event name on click. So the event name kind of matches what you'd use in JavaScript as opposed to like the Pascal casing. Uh, and then you can just type the name of a handler. So your handler has to exist in the code. So you can see here we've just got a private uh, method. You can accept the whatever the event passes through. So events can have parameters or they don't all have to have parameters. But in this case, the on click passes the mouse event args. You don't have to pass that through if you don't want. I mean, you can just ignore it. If you want to do anything asynchro asynchronous, you can just um, instead of having this return void, just have it return a task and it will work. You don't have to do anything special for that to work. Uh, and so the other, well, just to demonstrate that, I can click and you can see this counter value increments every time I click. So basically this event is just incrementing a counter and that counter is just being inserted into the view here. So uh, the other way we can, yeah, so this is kind of like the short syntax if we've just got an event method, we just type the name, but we can also handle inline events. So you just basically define a Lambda function and then you can do whatever you want. Obviously, you wouldn't want to do anything particularly complex inside of that. It's generally better to have a method, but if it's something really simple, it might make sense to do that. Um, so just demonstrating that if you click on the other button, which is actually which is decrementing that number, so you can see that going down there at the top. Um, just want to see what that note was. So we'll go into events a little bit more in the parameters section. That just gives you the basics. The so navigation and routing in Blazor. Let me just bring up the routing page. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is page routing. So at the top, we see this page directive. Um, and then just slash and then whatever uh, routing here. Um, so that's just obviously this is relative to wherever this is hosted. So that would be a base URL slash routing. Um, routing is kind of handled automatically for you. So you just have to define this. I'll show you in a second where that's set up, but it is set up by default when you set up a new uh, Blazor project. So any page can have multiple routes in this case. We've got two routes defined. So the first route is just going straight to routing. The second one is routing slash. And then we're using the curly braces to show that um, we're taking an ID parameter. Essentially, and you can use this colon int to give it the type of parameter we expect. So having multiple routes can be quite handy if you've got like a add edit scenario. You know, often you'll have a page that handles adding and editing. And a lot of the logic is the same. So in that case, it's quite handy to have the multiple routes um, used for the same page. You can see that this, this ID parameter actually maps to a parameter in the code section. 
So in the next section, we'll talk more about parameters, but any parameter has to have this parameter attribute defined, and then it has to be a property as well. Um, and the name has to map up here, so that's called ID, and this is ID, the type matches as well. In this case, we've made the ID nullable because if we go into this first route, which doesn't expect an ID, then obviously that ID isn't going to get set to anything. So that's the way we can tell in our logic as well. We can check the ID and if it's null, we know that it's like a new, the new version of the page. And if it's uh, got a value, we know that it's the edit version of the page if we're using it for an ad edit kind of scenario. Uh, so sorry, this next point is about route discovery. So as I mentioned earlier, routes are discovered automatically. Um, but that is set up in the app. App.razor file. Well, so all Blazor apps have this app.razor at the root, which is kind of like the basic setup um, of every page. And so this is the pretty much the default that you get with a new Blazor WASM project. Uh, so all this, this router is basically defined saying that route discovery will cover this entire context. Um, here we, the found element, anything inside of that found element is basically telling it what to do is if a route is found, basically it matches on an existing route. And then you can have a not found, which is defining, okay, what do we do if a route isn't found? So here it's just some basic behavior to show a not, not found page title and what little message saying there's nothing at this address. Um, the other thing with the route is we can define a default layout and we'll get into layouts a bit more in a sec, but here we can see that we're defining default layout as main layout. So basically every page will just have that layout by default unless we explicitly change it to something else. Uh, so that's kind of the key things about how we set up the routing. Um, So we talked about that. Talk about a page having multiple routes potentially. Okay, so just um, I guess route in terms of routing from one page to another in Blazor, I mean you can just obviously use a normal anchor tag. Um, the other way that you can route directly is you can use the navigation manager. So if you want to do that through code. What we just have to do is inject the navigation manager. So this is another Blazor directive. Just at inject, and then we can inject any sort of um, dependency that we want. And then in our code, uh, see so we've got another event handler here. We just call event manager navigate to, and we just give it an address. So just to demonstrate that, if I click here, uh, it's a bit hard to see, but the route did change to 33 at the top. And I'm also displaying whatever that ID value is here. So and that's how we navigate from page to page. But normally you just use an anchor tag. All right, so parameters. Um, so parameters uh, can be passed into a route, as we just talked about, with that ID being passed through into the page route, um, but often they're just passed through from one component to another. Um, so in this example, I've got a couple of card components, which are separate razor components that I've defined over here. And we can see that in the code section of each card, just ignore the cascading parameter for now, we'll get to that in a sec, but we can see that there are a bunch of parameters. So basically this is the stuff that the caller can define. What does this particular component look like or how does it behave? So we've got a header a flag to say, are we showing a hide button in this case? Um, we've also got a couple of render fragments. So I did mention render fragments before. So they're custom content that the caller of the component can define. And so they, we have a look 
in the actual view part, we can see that we can just use parameters wherever we want in the view. So here we can change this class to make everything bold if this show bold parameter is set true. Here we're just showing uh, inserting the header that's being defined. So this child content uh, is a render fragment. So basically anything that the parent defines for that, it will just render in there. Um, and then we can in our in our blazer code, we can just put if conditions if we want to hide certain parts of the view. Um, for example, here we've got a parameter show hide. So only if that's set, we're going to show this button. And that's just another render fragment. So if the footer content isn't now, we're going to render this footer content. Um, so with the render fragments, it's even if they are now, it's safe to just go ahead and render them. It won't cause an exception, but sometimes we want to check if they're null. Basically, if they've been defined by the caller, because if it's not defined, we don't want to show this out of div in this case. Uh, so let's go back to the routing page. Um, so you can see here we're defining. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> we can see here we're defining this card component. So once you create a component in Blazor, you just give the file a name. And basically you don't need to do anything else. You just refer to that name as if it's a HTML element, and that will insert that component in that location. If it's got any parameters, you can define define them just in line here. So we're saying the header is card one. Um, if it's got a render fragment that happens to be well, that is called child component, it's kind of got a special convention to say you don't need to define that it's child component. You just need to put some HTML inside of that element, and it will automatically render it as part of that child content. So that's kind of just a convention that they use, but as a second example of a card here, um, because we're defining multiple render fragments, we do have to be explicit. So we're saying, okay, for the child content, I want to render this HTML. For the footer content, I want to render this HTML. Um, and here I've also demonstrated a how events work from a component. So if I go back to the card razor, see that I've defined sorry, I've defined an event callback called hide clicked and I can invoke that inside of this component so whenever the hide click button is clicked on it will call this hide clicked handler and inside of that it just um, calls hide clicked invoke async so then that event gets invoked and then if the caller is caring about that event or handling that event then it will call the caller's handler. So that's how we create custom events in Blazor. Um, we can also pass, that's a simple event example, we can pass parameters through into an event so that the handler receives those parameters as well. Uh, so I think this demo was just showing that, uh, basically demonstrating the event handling. So basically when we click this high button, that card component is going to trigger that event. Um, this is going to handle it. It comes here. It says hide card equals true. And because here we're saying, OK, if hide, if not hide, hide card. So essentially we're saying if we're not hiding it, we're going to show it. But now we're hiding it. So that disappears from the view. Um, so that's basically the, the basics of parameters. I did mention cascading parameters, parameters briefly before. Um, so they're pretty handy, as I said before, that you can define a cascading parameter at a parent level or at a higher level, and that parameter value will just sort of go through all of the children. The children don't need to explicitly define that parameter. It's only if they care about it that they can define the parameter. So here you can see, as an example of this, I've got this cascading value. Uh, I've given it the name show bold, and I've given it a value of by defaulting to true, and we can change that value from the parent or from this layer. 
And then I've got inside of this cascading value, I've got a card. So if I go back to the card component, Um, we can see that we've got this cascading parameter with the name show bold and the type matches as a boolean. So anytime that the parent or doesn't, not the direct parent, but it could be a parent and quite a few layers up. I mean, in this case, it is a direct parent. But anytime the cascading value changes, it will automatically reflect here. And so we can demonstrate that if we toggling that show hide, sorry, the um, show bold value, we can see that changing the card component because it's receiving that cascading parameter value. It's changing the class based on the value there. Uh, so cascading values are very handy, by the way. They just, they do potentially create some performance issues, but I'll talk about that in a second. Now layouts, um, layouts, as I mentioned, are just a way of defining a common, um, a common layout really. <laughs> A common outer shell for your application, which most views are going to inherit from. You can use different layouts, like for example, normally you'd have a layout once you're logged into your app for your menu and all that sort of thing, but then you probably have a different layout for the login page, which doesn't need the menu or have the menu. This is a very basic example. Um, in this particular page layout, we're explicitly defining We're explicitly defining the layout as basic layout. Um, so if we don't define a layout, which most pages aren't, it's going to default to the main layout because that's what we've told it is a default. But in this case, the basic layout is very basic. It basically doesn't have any menu or anything. It's just showing the body with some styling around it. Um, just know if anyone's familiar or anyone's used MVC, Layouts and MVC are quite powerful. You can kind of define individual sections where you can render different bits of content. Uh, with Blazor layouts, they're a lot more basic. You've only really got this body that you can define, like you can't define different different templates to insert different bits into, if that makes sense. So um, yeah, they're quite limited, but they're still useful. All right. So Forms. I was just going to demonstrate a basic form in Blazor. Uh, so all forms need to have this edit form component that wraps the form. Uh, then we define a model for the form. So that's basically what the form is binding to. And we can define some event handlers for form events like on submit, six on valid submit and on invalid submit. So then within the form we can use, um, I mean you can create your own completely custom components, but by default you can use uh, some of the ones provided by the .NET framework, like input text, um, and then you can bind the value for that. So you're basically binding a value from your model to that text field, um, input number, input date, obviously the the basic sort of form elements that you would expect are provided. Um, you can pass custom classes into that, which will get applied directly to the import element as well. Um, and then you need to have a submit, a button of type submit, or at least a, something that's going to be a type submit so that when the form submits, it will trigger off a bunch of behavior, which includes um, includes validating the model. So we've included this data annotations validator, which is basically saying if the model is annotated with the data annotations like required, max length, that sort of thing, then it's going to respect that and it's going to validate those things. So we can see we're using this customer model and we're just giving it a few uh, data annotations like required, max length, range. So that edit form is going to um, it's going to be respecting those validation rules. Um, and this validation summary is basically just saying if there are any validation errors, show them here. Just using a default 
uh, .NET kind of styling out of the box, but you can customize that however you need. So just to give an example of that, um, if I move out of there because that's a required field on the model, we automatically get this validation summary showing up. Um, if I click submit and it's invalid, then it's going to trigger off this invalid submit handler because I've told it that that's the handler for the invalid event. And I've got a handler for the valid submit, which in this case is just going to set a Boolean flag. Obviously, normally you'd probably be talking to an API. So this validation is really just the form for model validation, but then after that you'd have to, you might have some back-end validation that you'd have to handle separately. Um, so just as an example, if I type something that is valid, click submit. So it's come to this valid submit handler, it's set this Boolean flag true. And I've just got a little bit of custom content to say if it's true, then show the submit is successful. That's a very basic of how we use forms. Um, and just to wrap up this demo, I'll talk a little bit about uh, JS interrupt. So yeah, as I mentioned before, like JS interrupt is a way that we can talk from our Blazor code, a C sharp code into JavaScript code. Uh, the normal reasons that we want to do that is let's say that we're using a JavaScript library like we're showing reports, for example. I mean, there are some, you know, Blazor native libraries to do these sort of things, but there's a lot more limited in choices at the moment. So you might still want to use some JS, um, JS frameworks. Uh, for example, in Cashflow, we're using uh, report viewer, which is a JS active reports report viewer, which is a JS component. Uh, we're also using a date picker JS component as well. Um, so calling into that is handy. Any sort of setup for like Google Tag Manager, Hotjar, that sort of stuff, you might want to call JavaScript just to set that sort of stuff up. Um, sometimes you want to, in JavaScript, you want to throttle your JS event callbacks. Like let's say that you want to detect the mouse move event on one of your components, but mouse move triggers quite a lot. So you don't want like 500 events triggering in quick succession. So in that case, you might go back. You might use JavaScript to throttle it. So you could get JavaScript to actually handle the event. And then it could say, OK, I'm only going to care about this event every half a second or something. And then it can call back to Blazor to actually do something with it. So that's another case that we've uh, we've used JS interrupt. Um, and then occasionally, not often, but occasionally you might want to manipulate the DOM directly through JavaScript. Most of the time you don't need to because Blazor handles all of that sort of stuff itself, but just found a few particular ex cases. Um, I think one was to do with displaying modals and we couldn't quite get it to transition the state how we wanted, so we had to call into JavaScript to kind of manually manipulate the DOM. Um, so I've just got a few examples of how we do this in JS interrupt. There's the code there. So the first example, we're using this uh, JS runtime, which is just a basically just inject by JS runtime at the top. And you just call it, if it's something that doesn't return a result, you can call it invoke void async. Um, you don't have, doesn't have to be async. If you're doing it in a synchronous context, you can just call invoke void. Uh, and then you're giving it a name. In this case, it is a global kind of JavaScript scope. So that app dot app JS show alert kind of has to exist on the window or the, <laughs> or the document of the, but there are other ways that you can do it in a more modular way. I haven't really gone into that in this demo, but so then we're just giving it parameters. So in this case, we're just passing it a simple text parameter, some sample text, and then you can see I've created just a little JS file, define window dot 
at JS. And then I've got a show alert. So this has to obviously map to what you're calling. And then all that's doing is taking in the text from Blazor and displaying it in alert. So just to demo that, we click, we get an alert and that's showing the text that we just passed through. Um, so I'll just go back here quickly. So another example, this is slightly different in that we're receiving a result from the JS call. So we're calling it in pretty much the same way. We're giving it the name that we want to call and then we're giving it a parameter value. But then we're also telling it that we expect to get an integer value back from JavaScript. And then we're just setting a local variable to that value. So if we look at the JS again, this is calculate square. It just takes it in and it returns the number times by itself. Um, so in this case, this value updated to nine because it got basically it got back the result of that. Um, and it set it to this and then in our DOM, we, sorry, in our view, we're just basically inserting that value here. And then just the last JS interrupt uh, demo that I wanted to do was showing how you can call Blazor from JavaScript. I think most of the time it would be the other way. Most of the time you're calling JavaScript from Blazor, but occasionally um, it's useful to be able to do it the other way. So here we are, we're still initializing it from Blazor, but that doesn't have to be the case. It's really just for the demonstration. You could have a timer, for example, in JavaScript. So every second it's calling Blazor to, I don't know, to do something. <laughs> um, but in this demo, we're initializing it. We do. We're passing an object reference, which is basically a reference to this particular view, this particular component, I should say. Um, and then we can see in the JS file, we're taking that reference, and then from the reference, we can call invoke method async. And then here we're giving it the name of the method that we want to invoke, which should exist in that component in Blazor, and then we're giving it a parameter, which is just a bit of a string to pass into it. So if we go back here, we can see message from JS, which matches that method name, and then it's taking in that parameter. Also, we have to give it this attribute JS invocable to indicate that it can be invoked from JavaScript. So if I click there, you can see it calls into JavaScript, then basically JavaScript calls back into Blazor passes that message through and we display that. Um, cool. So that's all the demo stuff I've got. Are there any questions at this point? Otherwise, I might just wrap up and talk about my personal views on Blazor. Uh, yeah. What's that, sorry? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't really go through that. Um, just repeat. OK, sure. Yeah, sorry. So I think the, the question was, how do we invoke that or insert that Blazor stuff into an HTML page? Is that right? Like, how does it kickstart the whole thing? Uh -huh. To the rest of it, it's just yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I, I don't know. Tell me if I'm misunderstanding, but everything does get kicked off from an index.html file. So, this is the basic HTML, there's nothing blazery or special about this. You don't have to have this. Yeah. Would it be the other way of having HTML component that Um I haven't really done that. Like everything's been a basically a component. I mean you could just have a razor view that does nothing apart from render HTML. The assembly rule is the non-extended. Uh, no, you can just normal.net. 
So we're using .NET 6 and then we'll probably oh, upgrade it. Work, okay. uh, we haven't had any real issues with compatibility or anything. It's just run. We started with .NET 3.1, then we moved to .NET 5 and now .NET 6. Um, seems to run pretty much everything apart, you know, obviously stuff that you can't do yeah. within a browser you wouldn't be able to do. Um, yeah. The other thing is the Ah, OK. Yeah, so whether we can interact with like say on a mobile device, that sort of thing, if you could interact with a camera. I haven't really looked at that either. Ours is just a web app, so we haven't really tried to do that. Um, I don't think there's any. I don't think there's anything special in Blazor that would make that easier. <laughs> at least not Blazor web assembly. Like you might still go through JavaScript to do that sort of thing. I'm not 100% sure to be honest. But yeah. But yeah, I mean this this index file was the first file that gets served. And we have this special. We just have a div with an app, uh, sorry, ID of app. Um, you can see here it's got like a placeholder loading. So before the Blazor part loads, it's just going to show this. Obviously, you style that up a bit nicer in the real app. Um, and then this script framework Blazor WebAssembly JS that's going to kick off the whole thing. So that will that will go and find that ID. Once everything's loaded and ready, it will find that ID and it will start rendering the app. Um, yeah, but yeah, this is just a normal HTML page. There's nothing special about it. Uh, yeah, if you've got a question. Uh, from your experience building with Blazor at work, which flavor did you choose and how did you come to such a decision? Yeah, so we we chose the WebAssembly version or flavor. Um, the main reason, I guess we wanted performance. So with the server version or the flavor, we didn't really like that it would have to be chatting to the server all the time. So we really wanted to develop it as a spa where most of it would be happening on the actual browser client itself. Um, and I guess I guess the other reason is for me, the Blazor server, I'm sure it has some good use cases, but it didn't seem, I don't know, it didn't seem like anything that new to me over MVC, apart from the fact that it's using SignalR, which, you know, I'm sure makes things more efficient, but I didn't like the fact that it still had to chat to the server all the time. So we we're kind of looking at a spa application. So we considered React and Angular and Blazor Wasm kind of fit within that same sort of category. So, is yeah. it a um, enterprise software and how heavy is the usage? How many, uh, how many users do you have? Yeah, it is a enterprise and it's like, like a publicly accessible app that we're have uh, recently launched into production. Um, currently, the user base isn't really big, but that's only because we've only recently launched. So it's, uh, you know, so far we haven't really, we haven't noticed any performance or issues in the production app, you know, prior to releasing it for the first time, we did notice a few things that we had to address. Um, but since it's been in production, I think it's been pretty performant. And, the only thing is uh, the initial load up time, which is the first time, but it's still not great. But <laughs> After that, it's all cached. And then if there's any changes, it will just, if it's like a DLL has been updated, it will only get those DLLs sort of updated. It's not going to prefetch everything. Yeah, that would be a good use case if you want it's to still be pretty much server rendered and high compatibility. Yet. Are you? Yeah, you can. And I thought about putting that in the demo, but I thought I was probably long enough. So, um, yeah, that's that's a really cool thing. We've in our project, we've actually got uh, we use a tool called NSwag to generate a C sharp HTTP client from our Swagger file on the API, and then we can just directly call that generated client from our Blazor code and works pretty seamlessly, so that part's pretty easy. Yeah. Um, well, I might just, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, so I've been playing with a bit of 
I would really like it to look pretty, like really this bag, like a Ferrari bag, or something that's yeah. in SharePoint or something. Have you come across any good? Uh, well, it's it's nice, but it's very <laughs> the purple sidebar and yeah, that, uh, yeah, that's like changing the brakes sometimes. <laughs> um, you can. There is some support from big sort of third party libraries like Telerik. They have a full Blazor suite now, which is pretty good. And we're using that for certain things, actually. Yeah, but I've tried the fancy as you want, but that does sometimes break. I don't know, it's just me. I have to break it sometimes. OK, I haven't. I mean, it's not. You might need to. Yeah, what I found with the app, you can change stuff, but you still need to like rebuild the project. I no, think. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm using Rider instead of Visual Studio, so I don't know if that's a Rider thing or if it works a bit more seamless than Visual Studio. But Rider. Yeah, so our JetBrains Rider, it's a, just a different IDE. It's a lot faster. Visual Studio. Um, yeah, I'll just I'll go into my sort of wrap up, and then if there's any other questions, we can go through those. Just have to get. Presentation back, sorry. And I think I have to change what I'm sharing on the online one as well. No, uh, so good, is it? I think so. Yep. Okay, good. <laughs> Work out. All right, so I've just done that. Okay, yeah, so I was just going to talk about a few performance pitfalls um, which are handy to know if you're developing with Blazor. So I did mention be briefly before the render tree. Um, so Blazor has an internal render tree, which um, basically does diffs to work out, OK, what's actually changed. And then only if something's really changed, it's going to go to the effort of sending that to the DOM, because it doesn't, it's kind of expensive to talk to the DOM, relatively expensive. So it tries to avoid that. Um, so that works pretty well. But it can you can still see slowdown if it's doing that re-evaluation of that render tree uh, quite a lot. Um, so one of the things that's good to understand in Blazor is any handled event is going to cause the component to re-render or at least re-evaluate its render state, but it will also cause any child component components of that to re-render themselves as well. So that can be a bit of a trap if you're not expecting it, particularly if you've got really tiny components, but let's say that you've got a grid and you've got tons of data and you've you know, you, you made lots of components because you think, oh, that's going to make everything reusable, but then you've got individual grid cells or their own components. That's kind of going to be cause a lot of hell for the rendering, especially if you've got tons of rows, because it's going to basically go through every single cell and reevaluate its render state. And even though that's relatively quick when you've got like hundreds of them going on at the same time, that uh, quickly gets slow. So we did find that um, as an issue. Uh, some of the ways you can get around it or mitigate it is every component exposes the should render method that you can override. So by default, that will return true. You can do whatever you want inside of that. Um, so you can kind of evaluate it yourself and say, oh, I know that nothing's changed. I'm just going to return false. And the good thing about that is if you do it at a higher level and it says false, then all of its that component's children won't render either. So you can kind of Sometimes in a grid scenario, you can catch it early and you say, no, I know that nothing's changed. I'm not going to re-render all of this stuff. And that's that's been a big um, saviour for some of the performance issues we found early on. Uh, also introduced in, I think, .NET 5 was virtualization. So when you do a for loop, there's a special virtualization element which you can use. Um, and you, you, I think you have to tell it like how high as each cell or something, but you can basically try to stop it from rendering stuff that it knows isn't on the page at the time. So if you've got like a large list of grid, it's only going to render the bit that it thinks is on the page at the time and kind of ignore the rest, which is uh, quite handy in certain circumstances. So the next one we found, which could cause issues uh, with cascading parameters. Uh, so cascading parameters I found really useful in Blazor because often I want to set something at a higher level and then just have a child be able to look at that value and not have to sort of pass parameters all the way down. The biggest uh, issue of that is if you set lots of cascading parameters, particularly at a higher level, 
they have to kind of track the state of everything underneath them so that they can know when something's changed and they can tell every everything that could be interested in that that it's changed. Um, that can get costly if you're not careful. So uh, mitigations for that is cascading parameters or values do have an is fixed flag. So you can set a cascading value that is fixed, which means that every time that value changes, its children aren't going to know about it. But sometimes you just got a value that you want to set once and it does save a lot of performance problems because it's not actually tracking it at that point. Uh, and the other thing you can do is just avoid cascading parameters when you know that they're causing performance issues. Um, for example, you could use regular .NET events in some, you know, if you just want to communicate a particular things happen, you could just use a normal .NET event in a service, for example, and then something else listens to that and says, OK, this has changed. So, so yeah, if you find particular issues, I would say don't completely avoid cascading parameters, but just be careful when you use them and be aware that they can cause issues. Um, another really big one is slow initial load. Um, so that's because it has to basically load all of the .NET assemblies. And it's not just the .NET framework assemblies, but it's if you're using any NuGet packages for other libraries like CSV, um, you know, reading CSV files, that sort of stuff, then all of that's going to get included by default. So plus your own application code. So that can add up to be quite big. Uh, it's even worse if you turn on ahead of time compilation, which can speed up things, but it actually makes the initial load slower because I just did a test of that and I found it increased the file size by about four times. So it's like, oh, no, no. <laughs> yeah, that was just like too much for us. It wasn't worth it, but I'm sure there are cases where that's still um, a viable thing to do. So some mitigation strategies, uh, obviously, I mean, you really want to be doing this anyway, but make sure you've got compression of any files that are downloaded, uh, gzip or brotly or whatever else. I think brotly is probably actually a bit Compressor is a bit better than GZIP. Uh, there is an option to lazy load assemblies, so I haven't really fully explored that, but you can basically say only load a certain set of core assemblies that you need for that first page, and then other pages you can say, oh, this page requires these particular set of extra assemblies. So the first time it's going to, first time it hits that different page, it's going to download those extra assemblies if it doesn't have it. I think that would be a good one. I just haven't had time to fully explore it. Uh, avoid ahead of time compilation because it increases that yeah your DLL size considerably if that's important to you. Um, there are some project level options you can turn off certain library features like if you don't care about time different time zone support or globalization you could turn those things off and that just reduces the amount of DLLs so that it has to um, download. There's also an option which I've, I haven't really looked at much but. I don't have here it's pre-rendering so you can pre-render certain pages on your server which I haven't really tried but that, I think you can do it so that your initial load uses pre-rendered pages I think that could speed it up a fair bit but it also kind of looks a bit messy the way that you have to do it but might be worth it if it's a big problem uh so JS interrupt uh so JS interrupt calls do you have an overhead that overhead has reduced um, with newer .NET versions, so it's kind of getting better and better. Um, so I guess just don't be too chatty. Like if you want to update some of the DOM, for example, try to do it in one JS call. Don't have individual calls for every little thing you want to do. Um, yeah, and I, I did mention this before, but just be careful with any sort of event that you know is going to fire in quick succession like on scroll on mouse move that could slow down your performance a fair bit and that's because by behind the scenes blazer is talking to javascript to handle all those events so you can throttle those sort of things through javascript and then call into blazer only when you want to handle that all right um cool so just to wrap up my final thoughts on blazer um so what, what I really like about Blazor is sharing the code between the back end and front end. Uh, I found that really useful. Like we just have the same set of models in a different project and we can define all the validation rules and it's the same on the server and the front end. Um, 
we got tons of util kind of methods, like lots of extension methods and just basic like date helpers and whatever. So we can reuse all of that stuff, which is really good. Um, I quite like working in C Sharp. I mean, I don't mind JavaScript, but I still find C Sharp just a bit easier to work with. Uh, unit testing, so you can unit test. I mean, unit testing components is a bit different in terms of the view sort of stuff, but if you've got lots of services in your um, Blazor app, you can still unit test that using the same framework because it's just you know C sharp. So if you use X unit or whatever, you could use the same. Uh, WebAssembly can be faster than JavaScript in some contexts. That's probably not really from personal experience because we're not really doing CPU heavy type tasks, but certainly I have read that it can be pretty fast for certain operations. Um, some of the bad things I found. Basically, those performance pitfalls I just went through, those are they're not sort of things that should stop you using Blazor, I don't think, but they are things you have to be aware of, and there are generally ways you can mitigate those. Uh, there is more limited support for UI component libraries, um, as in, you know, React or Angular, whatever, they've been around for a while, they're popular, they're going to have a lot more support from um, big libraries, uh, but there are some for Laser like Telerik, uh, Dev Express have something as well, and there's a few others. So, uh, probably maybe one of the biggest downfalls is just that not that many people have Blazor experience. So, if you're looking for front end devs, you're probably going to have a hard time finding someone with Blazor experience, I would say. Um, and I'd say the ugly <laughs> is probably that the initial slow loading time. It's probably the worst thing <laughs> I think about Blazor. I really like Blazor, but that's the thing that you can't really fully overcome. I think like something like React is always going to be a smaller download. But it is only the first time, but at the same time, if it's a public app, first time kind of matters as well. So you know. And yeah, that was all really. Um, just uh, any questions before we wrap it up? Good. Uh, more like, I mean, it really depends, but probably if you get it really small, I've heard someone saying they got it down to about four megabytes and that's like with a lot of effort, but you're probably looking more commonly like 10 megabytes, that sort of thing. So it's not small. Well, a lot of it. You can do the lazy loading thing, so you only, but that's still at a DLL level, so you can't. So it's not looking at the DLL and saying, "Oh, you're not using this bit. I'm not going to bother." So you're still having to just with the .NET framework, the basics that it needs. It's still a fair size, and you can't. You can only get rid of certain things, like if you don't need globalization, you can get rid of that. But yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you.